بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad So in our previous episodes we were discussing the event of the Isra and the Mi'raj. And we went over the Hadith literature that details that, uh, that transformational experience. And now we resume uh, the earthly events uh, in the Seerah. If you recall, a few episodes ago, we mentioned that the, the uncle of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Hamza uh, formally announces his conversion to Islam in the sixth year after the Bi'tha. We also spoke about uh, the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And therefore you find that in the sixth and seventh year after the Bi'tha, the conversion of Hamza coupled with the successful emigration of the early Muslims to Abyssinia, highlighted Quraysh's inability to halt the growth of Islam in Mecca. So from the perspective of the likes of Abu Jahl and his ilk, the Prophet ﷺ has been considerably successful. He has recruited some very influential personalities. Not only that, but even the downtrodden and the individuals who don't hail from prominent clans and tribes, they have been able to find a safe haven in Abyssinia. So the Prophet's movement is growing. He has the the protection of Abu Talib in Mecca and Abu Talib has extended protections to other uh, vulnerable individuals. The Prophet, through the emigration to Abyssinia, has planted the seeds of Islam in other regions. So, God forbid, if his movement fails in Mecca, the movement has already spread to neighboring regions. And this became very alarming to the Quraysh. They now realize that the situation is reaching a point that is beyond containment. And, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. So, in desperation, the leaders of Quraysh arrange a meeting to draft crippling sanctions against the Prophet's clan, of course, being uh, Bani Hashim. Now there's debate over when the the boycott actually took place. We can say uh, pretty uh, safely that it happened sometime in the sixth and seventh year after the Bi'tha. So, you know, just to kind of recap, we mentioned that the Isra and the Mi'raj may have happened in the early Meccan period or the middle of the Meccan period because we mentioned the tradition from Imam al-Sadiq where the Prophet went on multiple ascensions. So this happened uh, during this time. Lady Fatima al-Zahra, according to the Shi'i narrative, uh, was born in the fifth year after the Bi'tha. Hamza uh, f- uh, publicly proclaims his conversion to Islam in the sixth year after the Hijrah, along with, uh, according to uh, some accounts, Umar ibn al-Khattab joins Islam around the same time. And then you have the, the boycott. So the boycott happens in the approximately in the seventh year after the Bi'tha. And this is uh, significant because when we speak about the, the boycott or the embargo or the sanctions, whatever you want to call it, if you recall... Quraysh initially tried to negotiate with Abu Talib. 
The negotiations failed. They tried to come to a compromise. Abu Talib was not willing to compromise with them. The situation became so dire in the minds of Quraysh that they contemplated killing the Prophet. But then they realized that if, if any of us kill the Prophet, this could risk an all-out civil war in Arabia. And that's not something that we're willing to do because of the economic consequences of an all-out war in, uh, in Arabia. So they decide that the next best thing that might put an end to the, to the Prophet's movement is that 40 leaders, they, they decide to impose these sanctions. 40 leaders of Quraysh placed their seals on a document. They basically drafted these crippling sanctions. And that document uh, became known as As-Sahifatul Qati'a. As-Sahifatul Qati'a basically refers to a document of severing ties, which comes from the word Muqata'a. You know, you know, we have the, the concept of Qat'ur Rahim, you know, to sever ties with your nearest of kin. This was an unprecedented move in Arabian history because you can imagine that in a, in a culture that is built on tribal systems, for a tribe to say that, listen, so Quraysh essentially go to Abu Talib and they say, hand over uh, Muhammad, we're going to kill him and we're willing to pay whatever blood money that you, that you want. So you name, you name us the price. Abu Talib uh, is not willing to hand over the Prophet. And they say, okay, if you're not willing to hand him over and to accept blood money in exchange for his murder, then we're going to cut you off. We're going to cut you off from Quraysh. We are no, we're going to essentially excommunicate you. We no longer consider you a part of our tribe. This is unprecedented in Arabian history for a tribe to excommunicate one of its own. And this is essentially what happens. So 40 leaders of Quraysh, they come together, they draft this document, and they all, you know, there were no signatures at the time. They basically had a seal. Each of these individuals had their own individualized seal. They would seal uh, the document uh, with, you know, perhaps you know some type of wax, and they did this in Darul Nadwa, which which was basically the the parliament uh, in uh, in Mecca. Now, what were the terms and the conditions of this boycott? They basically said that no one from Quraysh will marry anyone from Beni Hashim. In addition to the boycott on marriage, we will no longer buy or sell to them. So, an e a full economic, economic boycott. We will not marry from them. We will not engage in any business transactions with them. We will not talk to them. So, we will socially cut them off. We will not keep their company we will completely sever ties with them. Why? What is the goal? Until these sanctions will be imposed on them until they surrender Muhammad until they surrender Muhammad so that we can kill him. So they draft this document. 40 leaders of Quraysh, they place their seals. Even Abu Lahab, and again, this is also unprecedented that the someone who belongs to Bani Hashim places his seal and imposes sanctions and approves of the embargo on his own clan. After the, the document was drafted, after it was signed, after it was sealed, they hung 
this sahifa, this document inside of the Kaaba. Now news reaches Abu Talib that 40 members of Quraysh, 40 prominent uh, individuals from the various clans of Quraysh, they have decided to boycott Bani Hashim. And of course, Abu Talib knows, he, he hears the terms of uh, the boycott, and he sees that the motive behind the boycott is to surrender the Prophet so that, that, so that they can kill him. Now in response, Abu Talib, he gathered the clan of Hashim. He, ga he gathered all of the Bani Hashim. You know, Abu Talib is the chief of Bani Hashim. He's the leader of the Hashimites. He gathers them all together and he swears an oath. And this narration is mentioned in Tafsir al-Qummi, volume 1, page 380 for those who want to see the actual narration. The narration says, فَلَمَّ اجْتَمَعَتْ قُرَيْشُ عَلَىٰ قَتْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَكَتَبُ الصَّحِيفَةَ الْقَاطِعَ When Quraysh came together with the intention to kill the Prophet, they, they wrote, they drafted a sahifatul qata. They drafted the, the sanctions. The goal was to pressure Bani Hashim to economically squeeze them to the point where they surrender the Prophet. When they did this, Jama'a Abu Talib Bani Hashim. Abu Talib gathered his family, he gathered his clan. وَحَلَفَ لَهُمْ بِالْبَيْتِ وَالْرُكْنِ وَالْمَقَامِ وَالْمَشَاعِرِ فِي الْكَعْبَةِ Abu Talib swears, he says, by the Kaaba, by the black stone, by the maqam of Ibrahim, by the relics within the Kaaba. He makes multiple oaths. And this is a culture that takes oaths very seriously. So he's emphasizing the importance of what he's about to say and the seriousness of the situation. He says, by the Kaaba, by the black stone, by the station of Ibrahim and the relics within the Kaaba, if Muhammad is so much as poked by a splinter, I shall come after you all. Abu Talib essentially threatens the members of Bani Hashim that if anything happens to Muhammad, I will hold you personally responsible. If the slightest harm reaches him, I will blame each and every one of you. It's basically Abu Talib placing a communal obligation upon Bani Hashim that your only goal moving forward, your only mission, your only job, is to protect and to guard the Prophet The narration continues, and Abu Talib says, the narration says, فَأَدْخَلَهُ الشِّعْذِ وَكَانَ يُحْرِسُهُ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ قَائِمًا عَلَىٰ رَأْسِهِ بِالسَّيْفِ أَرْبَعْ سِنِينَ Quraysh did not force Abu Talib into that valley, which is known as the Shi'ab of Abi Talib. When Abu Talib realized that there is, that the Prophet's life is in actual danger, he took Rasulullah to the valley. Now the Shi'ab of Abi Talib is a parcel of land that is adjacent, that is across from the Kaaba, it's very close to the Kaaba, and it's situated next to Jabal Abi Qubais. And the way, just if you look at the, uh, if you look at a map of ancient Arabia, if you look at a map of Arabia at the time, you'll see that the Shi'ab of Abi Talib is located very close to the Kaaba, and it's surrounded by mountains on all three sides. So it's a very safe area because of the mountains. 
And the only passage, you, you have only one passage, which is from the Kaaba. It's basically opened towards the Kaaba, and it's surrounded from behind, from the right and from the left, with mountains. And this land belonged to Abu Talib, and perhaps this was inherited. The Prophet's forefathers had purchased this land. This is where the, the Prophet was uh, uh, born in this area, very close to this area. So it was a place that belonged to Abu Talib. It was a safe haven for them. It was a place that he was familiar with. And it was a, a place that would provide protection. They were, they were guarded and shielded by the mountains. And the only way to get into the Shi'ab of Abi Talib would be from this one passageway, which they guarded very carefully. So the narration says, Abu Talib brought the Prophet into the valley and guarded him day and night. He guarded him with sword ready by night for four years. I want you to take a moment, brothers and sisters, and appreciate how much Abu Talib defended the Prophet. You know, sometimes we have this image of him as, you know, an elderly man who just simply negotiated with Quraysh and, you know, asked them to leave his son, his, uh, his nephew alone. But when you look at the traditions, Abu Talib lived through these sanctions. He lived through an extreme boycott. He would spend, this is an elderly man, who would spend sleepless nights with a sword in his hand, and he would watch over the Prophet as he slept. He did this for four years. We have other narrations that mention that in the middle of the night, he would shift his children around and he would put Ali in the place of the Prophet. He would ensure that the Prophet does not sleep in the same place every night. Rasulullah, he would place him in the middle and he would make his sons sleep around the Prophet and he would move them, and sometimes he would place Ali in the place of the Prophet. SubhanAllah. You see that this, this love for the Prophet, this love of defending the Prophet was passed on to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib grew up watching his own father holding a sword and defending the Prophet, watching over him, guarding him. So, you know, as we'll see later on, it was very natural for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib to sleep in the bed of the Prophet and to put his life in danger to protect the Prophet because Ali was doing this all along as a child. It was his father who instilled in him this sense of duty to the Prophet that the most important thing is the protection of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So Abu Talib would shift his children around and place Ali in place of the Prophet. Now, as if it was not enough that these sanctions were imposed on Banu Hashim, and of course, Banu uh, Abdul Muttalib, they felt, you know, because their nearest of kin was uh, going through these sanctions, they sympathized with them and those sanctions were also imposed on them. So you have uh, the clan of Abdul Muttalib, uh, Banu Abdul Muttalib, also joining the, the clan of the, uh, of the Bani Hashim. Now Abu Jahl, who was one of the, the principal drafters of the, the document, Al-As ibn Wa'il, Al-Nadr ibn Al-Harith, and Uqba ibn Abi Mu'eed, they used to actually stand at the gates of Mecca and warned anyone who entered, they warned, them, they warned them of the blockage of the sanctions that were being imposed on Bani Hashim and any newcomers, any visitors who would come to Mecca, they would be warned that, listen, if you engage in any business transactions, with Bani Hashim, you 
and your tribe will be looted. If you buy or sell anything to Beni Hashim, you're going to get robbed. We will loot your caravans. So, not only does Quraysh impose sanctions upon Banu Hashim, but they threaten any tribes or any visitors who come to Mecca, they threaten them that if you buy or sell anything from the Hashemites, you will be looted, you will be penalized. It was during this period, brothers and sisters, we heard in our, we discussed in our previous episodes that Khadija was an incredibly wealthy woman. And we've often heard of those traditions that mention that if it were not for the wealth of Khadija and the sword of Ali, Islam would have never been established. It was during this time period, my dear brothers and sisters, that the wealth of Khadija literally saved the Muslims because they had no way of surviving. It was her wealth that was sustaining them. It was the wealth of Khadija that was being used to purchase food, to purchase whatever they needed to survive during this embargo. So Khadija surrendered all of her wealth to support the Prophet during this time. And <clears throat> she actually exhausts all her wealth. Every single dinar and dirham that she possessed was spent during these three to four years, during this four year period. Now, in his book, Muhammad, Prophet and Statesman, which I which I recommend that you that you read because I think uh, William Montgomery Watt, who is a Scottish historian and he's a professor of Islamic studies, he does a very good job uh, of describing the conditions of the early Muslims in the Sha'b of Abi Talib. Uh, here's an excerpt from his book where he he describes the the suffering and the the inhumane conditions that the Muslims were experiencing during the Sha'b of uh, in the Sha'b of Abi Talib. He says about the conditions during the boycott, he says, and I quote, it was a horrible and deadly siege. The supply of food was almost stopped and the people in confinement faced great hardships. They had to eat leaves and skin of animals. Cries of little children suffering from hunger used to be heard clearly. During prohibited months, during an Ashur al Hurum, when hostilities traditionally ceased, they would leave their confinement and buy food coming from outside Mecca. Even then, the foodstuff was unjustly overpriced so that the financial situation would fall short of finding access to it. So for example, during the month of Rajab, because it was one of the sacred months, Banu Hashim would be able to venture out into Mecca. They would leave the confinement. They would leave the valley of Abu Talib. And they would forage. They would look for food. Now of course, Quraysh would not sell them any food. So they would try to purchase food from people from outside of Mecca. And this is where you see Abu Jahl saying to those tribes who live outside of Mecca that I am willing to offer you double or triple what Banu Hashim offers you. And therefore the prices of food became inflated. So even when they were able to venture out and leave their confinement, the price of the prices of food the price of food was raised astronomically and on many occasions they simply couldn't afford the food because when you have abu jahl telling you that you know why sell that wheat and those dates to the bani hashim for that price i'll pay you triple i'll pay you double and many people would end up selling uh, their food to the likes of abu jahl 
So the prices of food were artificially inflated because of the, uh, the offers of uh, Abu Jahl and his ilk. There is a, a hadith that al muttaq al-Hindi mentions in Kanzul Umman, where, and of course, uh, al muttaq al-Hindi is a Sunni hadith scholar, uh, but nonetheless, I think this hadith really captures how difficult those days were uh, in the Shi'ab of Abi Talib during the embargo. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, لَقَدْ أُوذِيتُ فِي اللَّهِ وَمَا يُؤْذَى أَحَدْ I was suffering for the sake of God. وَأُخِفْتُ فِي اللَّهِ وَمَا يُخَافُ أَحَدْ and I was threatened for the sake of God in a way that no one was threatened. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ, he was the main target. You know, Quraysh wanted no... The whole purpose of these sanctions was to force the Hashemites to give up the Prophet. And then Rasulullah ﷺ says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَتْ عَلَيَّ ثَلَاثُونَ مِنْ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَ وَمَالِي وَلِبِلَالٍ طَعَامٌ يَأْكُلُهُ ذُو كَبِدٍ إِلَّا شَيْءٌ يُوَارِيهِ إِبْطُ بِلَالٍ The Prophet said, Thirty days and nights passed once, when neither Bilal nor I had any food that a man, uh, that a man may eat except what Bilal may use to cover his armpits. Meaning, the Prophet is saying that for at least a month we would eat nothing but leaves and shrubbery that Bilal would gather around from around the mountain hideout, from the valley of Abu Talib. They had nothing to eat. They would literally eat leaves. They would eat whatever grew from the earth. And keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that from the year 7 to the year 10, or the year 6, you know, six, six and a half years after the Ba'tha, to the 10th year after the Ba'tha, Fatima to Zahra was a toddler. Maximum at the end of the boycott, she was 5 years old. And it was during this period, you can imagine, a toddler, you know, for those of you who have young children, imagine what it was like to be the head of a community like the Prophet, to have young children with you, and you have nothing to eat but leaves. And it was during this time period that Fatima to Zahra actually provided emotional comfort to her father. It was during this time that the Prophet said, Fatima Ummu Abiha. So Fatima to Zahra, as a young girl, she was not a burden upon the Prophet. She did not cause the Prophet more grief. She did not complain to the Prophet and add to his agony. She acted as a mother to the Prophet. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was maybe 17, 18 years old during this period. He was a teenager. And it was Ali ibn Abi Talib who used to take the money of Khadija. She would give him some gold coins, some dinars, some dirhams, whatever. And he would go out in the middle of the night. And he would go and meet with people and procure food for the Prophet and for the, the Bani Hashim. So... This is what they lived through, my dear brothers and sisters. And I think that, you know, when we think about the suffering of the early Muslims, we forget that they endured these periods of starvation. They were being starved to death. Rasulullah used to go to bed hungry. He had eaten nothing but leaves. Khadija the same. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was the same. Fatima to Zahra also endured this. Bilal was there with them. Now, of course, it's important to note that, you know, the likes of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abu Bakr, others who belong to other clans, they were not there. And we don't even have any evidence that they were delivering food 
to the Muslims when they were in the Shu'ab of Abi Talib. We don't have any authentic narrations that mention this. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was putting himself at risk when he used to go out to purchase food. We also have narrations that mention a few individuals who tried to offer some help and assistance to Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib uh, during this period. Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' who was the Prophet's son-in-law. He was a husband to Zainab, who was one of the daughters of the Prophet. And I know it's debated whether Fatima to Zahra was the only daughter of the Prophet or if he had more daughters. There's a debate, but it seems that the, the stronger opinion is that the Prophet had uh, other daughters. Now, in any case, the Prophet's uh, son-in-law, if you want to consider him the son-in-law of the Prophet or if he was married uh, to, uh, to someone who was uh, married to the, the daughter of Khadija's sisters, whoever it is, the point is Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi' would help by loading up camels with wheat and dates and letting, letting them wander into the valley. So people would not, they would not be allowed to enter the Shi'ab of Abu Talib. And this area was being watched. So what they would do is they would load camels and they would pretend as though this camel basically just wandered off on its own into the valley of Abu Talib. And when these camels would arrive, the Prophet Abu Talib and the Muslims who were there, the Hashemites that were there, they would unload the food and they would store it and they would consume that food. Now, as I mentioned, the, the boycott lasted for four years. <clears throat> and the only times they were granted permission and they had access to the other parts of Mecca, they could leave the confinement, was during... Uh, the sacred months, especially during the Umrah of Rajab, the, the minor Hajj, which was you know practiced even during the times of Jahiliyyah, and during the Hajj season. Now, it was during this time that Banu Hashim could exit the valley and trade. But as I mentioned, they oftentimes it would be too expensive for them to buy food because the the price of food was... Uh, was increased because of people like Abu Talib who were offering, who were willing to pay double or triple as long as caravans do not sell to Banu Hashim. Now the Prophet ﷺ also made use of this time when he when when they were allowed to leave the confinement of Shia Abi Talib, he would preach to the pilgrims, people who would be, who would come from all around the the Arabian Peninsula, the Prophet would speak to them, he would deliver sermons, he would interact with them, and he would invite them to monotheism. And it was during this time period that Abu Lahab used to harass the Prophet, especially during this time. He would, whenever the Prophet would try to interact or spark up a conversation with a pilgrim, Abu Lahab would walk behind Rasulullah and he would tell the people, you know, ignore my, my nephew, he's insane. He has some mental problems. So imagine, the Prophet, for months and months, he goes through these periods of starvation and hardship and isolation. He comes out of confinement during the sacred months, and he's followed by his uncle, who constantly tells visitors and pilgrims, don't listen to my nephew because he's insane. Brothers and sisters, imagine the sabr, the, the patience of Rasulullah. Now, although the terms of the ban permit the Prophet to enter the holy sanctuary during the four sacred months, his visits were often met with jeers and harassment. Do you think the Prophet ﷺ when he would leave the confinement of the Shi'ab of Abi Talib, people would welcome him with open arms. No, the Quraysh would mock him wherever he would go. 
<clears throat> they would whisper to each other that, you know, this Quran that he's reciting is nothing more than Asatir al Awaleen. It's nothing more than ancient tales, stories of the past. But despite the constant humiliation, the Prophet ﷺ, he remained steadfast. He was undeterred by their mockery. And the Prophet allowed the Quran to respond to them. For example, we find in Surah Al Mutaffifin, <coughs> Allah says, إِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِ آيَاتُنَا قَالَ أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ when our verses are read to one of them, he says, and this, these verses were revealed during the, the boycott. When our verses are read to one of them, he says, tales from the past. No way, not so. Their hearts are rusted by the burden of the sins they've earned. <clears throat> so the boycott lasted for approximately four years. Now the question is, how did the boycott end? How did these crippling sanctions eventually end? Now, one of the main reasons that the boycott came to an end is that one day the Prophet ﷺ he told Abu Talib, he told his uncle, Oh my uncle, tell the Quraysh that the document in which they conspired to enforce the boycott, as sahifatul qati'a that document that they, they've hung inside of the Kaaba, go and tell them that the document has been destroyed by termites. Now, Abu Talib, he goes to Quraysh and he says to them that my nephew says that that document that you drafted, the crippling sanctions that are contained in that document that you drafted, that you hung inside of the Kaaba and you locked the door of the Kaaba and of course no one has access to the inside of the Kaaba, the door is locked. Abu Talib says, my nephew says that the document has been destroyed by termites. Quraysh, they say, this is nonsense. We have sealed the document with 40 seals. We've hung it inside of the Kaaba. The door of the Kaaba is locked. No one has gone inside. How could it be destroyed? Abu Talib, he says, that I'll make a deal with you. I'll make a bet with you. Of course, not like I'm, I'm talking about a metaphorical bet, not a literal bet. Abu Talib challenges them and he says that I promise to surrender my nephew to you if this news is false. So this is a challenge. So the Quraysh, they jump on the opportunity. They said, this is what we've been waiting for. We know for a fact that the document is inside the Kaaba. And now we're going to go inside the Kaaba. We're going to open it and prove that your nephew is a liar. And you're a man of your word, O Abu Talib. So now you have to surrender him to us. And we're going to kill Muhammad and put an end to all of this nonsense. We can go back to our original way of life. We can go back to the, old, the good old days. So Quraysh, they go. They go to the Kaaba. They open the 40 seals and they find that all of the words of the document were eaten except Bismik Allah, Allahumma in your name, O God, and the name Muhammad. There are only two things remained from this document. All of the other details, the only words that remained on the page were in your name, O God, and the, the blessed name of Rasulullah, the name of Muhammad. And subhanAllah, you know, these names are eternally interconnected. And it's not a, an accident 
that when we raise our voices and we call the adhan, after mentioning the name of Allah, immediately after that we say, we say, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ we bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And this is what Allah means, brothers and sisters, when He says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ O oh, Muhammad, one of the meanings is, we have elevated your name. Meaning, whenever the name of God is mentioned, your name is mentioned alongside Him. Because He is the Lord of the worlds, and you are the best among the worlds. You are His crowning creation. So this mu'jizah, this miracle, essentially breaks the consensus against the Prophet. Because it, originally, there was an agreement that we want to impose these sanctions on the Prophet. But after witnessing this miracle, there was talk about, you know, maybe we should end these sanctions. Furthermore, there were many non-Muslims who were sympathetic towards Bani Hashim. They felt that this was immoral especially considering that children literally died of starvation during the, the boycott. And it was unprecedented. It was antithetical even to jahili. It was antithetical even to the jahili moral code to sever ties with your own kin. So there was mounting pressure from the likes of uh, Mut'am ibn Adi and, uh, and others, Hisham ibn Amr, others who were non-Muslims, but they, they felt that the, the sanctions were unethical, they were immoral, and therefore eventually the, the sanctions were lifted. And some, of course, decided to just outwardly defect from those terms, uh, and some of those individuals were related to the Prophet through their mothers. So this is a little bit about uh, the boycott and what happened in the Shi'ab of Abi Talib during those, uh, those four years. And of course, uh, it was during this time period that the Prophet ﷺ lost the two pillars of his life. He loses his uncle Abu Talib and his beloved wife Khadija. And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak more about uh, what uh, uh, the events leading up to the tragic deaths of Abu Talib and Khadija. We'll cover that, inshallah, in our next episode. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. And I look forward to having you join me on uh, upcoming episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. So the Mushrikeen of Mecca believed in Allah. They believe that Allah is the creator. So they are, they are monotheistic in the sense that they believe that Allah is Al-Khaliq. That He is the ultimate creator. He is the highest God. Allah in many verses, He says, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ If you ask these polytheists, who created the heavens and the earth, they would say, surely it is Allah. The, the area where they associate partners with God is when it comes to the managing and the sustaining of the universe. So they believe that Allah is the sole creator, but they do not believe that Allah is the sole Rabb. They believe in these lesser gods uh, who manage and who sustain the affairs of creation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their minds is the creator, but he is, he is aloof of, to the affairs of human beings. 
We worship lesser gods who are closer to us, who are more concerned with the everyday activities of human beings. So when it came to important documents, they would invoke the name of that higher God. They would invoke the name of Allah. But when it comes to issues of rizq, you know, safety, and other worldly matters, they would invoke uh, their idols and they would see their idols as, uh, as means to attaining nearness to that higher God, that, that God who is, does not interfere with the, uh, the events of uh, the, the earthly events. Does that make sense? So, it was not only the, the Muslims who were in the, the Shi'ab of Abi Talib. This was a boycott that was imposed upon the entire clan. Now, there were some Muslims who were not part of the Bani Hashim, who, who because of their devotion, because of their love for the Prophet, they were there. You know, Bilal, for example, was there because, you know, he didn't have a tribe. He was essentially, uh, he had no one. So, he was there. He did not have the protection of a tribe. Uh, Abbas uh, ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's uncle, who was not yet a Muslim. He was neutral, but because of uh, tribal alliances, because he had a duty to his, his, uh, his clan, he was there. So the boycott impacted the Muslim and the non-Muslim members of the clan. And there were Muslims who were not affected by the the, uh, the boycott. You know, for example, you have people like, you know, Abu Bakr and Umar. These, they were not, they, they, they did not live through the, the boycott. And, and according to the Sunni narrative, they used to send food and supplies to the Prophet, but I don't, we don't have any authentic hadith, and I challenge anyone, I haven't seen it, to provide an authentic narration where Abu Bakr and Umar and, or even Uthman provided any food supplies to the Prophet and the Hashemites during this four-year period. We mentioned, you know, Hakim ibn, ibn Hizam, uh, Mut'am ibn Adi, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib used to go out, uh, the Prophet's uh, son-in-law, Al-Asa, Al who, who we mentioned earlier. So there were a handful of people who who tried to to help. But, uh, but yeah, so some... Many Muslims were not affected by the boycott because the boycott targeted Bani Hashim. And the goal of the boycott was to put economic pressure on Bani Hashim until they can't survive anymore and they, and they end up breaking and surrendering the Prophet. Because Quraysh knew that if we kill the Prophet, we have killed Islam itself. So that was the, that was the mission. So, I mean, if, if we do a little bit of math, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was 10 years old when the Prophet was 40. So, the, the, his bi'tha, the beginning of his, his prophethood. And in da'wat the ashira he was 13. Th three years after bi'tha, he was 13. If the Boycott happened in the seventh year after the Bi'tha, 13 plus 4, 17. So Amir al-Mu'mineen at the beginning of the boycott was 16 to 17 years old. And at the end of the boycott, he was about 20 years old. So he was a teenager. And he played a very important role. Of course, Khadija was the financial backbone. She was the reason why they were able to eat anything. She financially supported all of the Hashemites during this period. Ali ibn Abi Talib, and it was, you, would, you, you would be risking your life to go out and try to procure food. Ali ibn Abi Talib did that. He would, he would voluntarily sleep in the place where the Prophet would sleep. He would guard the Prophet in the same way that his, that his father 
was guarding the Prophet. So Ali ibn Abi Talib grew up watching his father stand vigil at night and watch over the Prophet as he slept. This is Abu Talib. And unfortunately, Abu Talib is not given due credit. You know, according to the, the Muslim world today, Abu Sufyan, they say, رضي الله عن, معاوية رضي الله عن, but, but Abu Talib is a kafir. He died as a kafir. And they chalk, you know, all of this devotion and loyalty to the Prophet, they, they chalk it up to just tribal loyalty. But I think we can all agree by when you read about what he does, this is much, this is much deeper than tribal loyalty. Because if it's about tribal loyalty, well, what, what happened to the tribal loyalty of, of Abu Lahab? Abu Talib was a staunch believer. Abu Talib was one of awliyaullah. If it wasn't for Abu Talib, the Prophet would have never survived. So, inshallah, we'll speak more about, uh, the, about Khadija and Abu Talib in the, in the next episode. But yeah, so Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was a teenager. He was a young man, 7, 16, 17 years old when, this, uh, when the sanctions were imposed. So it, it wasn't it wasn't very big. If you look at some of the the biographies of the prophet, especially in English, I think even on if you go online, you can find uh, you can find uh, some images. But unfortunately, a lot of these areas have been demolished. Uh, I believe the prophet's birthplace was turned into a library. The Saudi government has, you know, raised many of these uh, uh, these historical sites. And they've, you know, they've built their own sky rises. So unfortunately, uh, this area has been completely decimated. It was demolished, and you know, they've they've built. I mean, I, the last time I was in in Mecca was in 2006. So I, I don't. I'm sure they've done even more damage. You know, unfortunately, the Saudi government doesn't believe in uh, heritage preservation. No, what, what, what it means is, if you look at the, the, the narration, you can imagine that you have to eat a lot of shrubbery to get full. You know, for those of you who, who have like, a, who, who eat a low carb diet, or you don't eat meat, for example, you know that you have to eat a pretty big salad to get full, to fill your stomach. What this means is that they would gather so much that in addition to the, the shrubbery they would hold with their hands, they would hold whatever else they can gather under their arms. So they, they would put it under their armpits and in their hands to, to, to pick up as much shrubbery and leaves that they could uh, to eat. Because again, they're trying to gather food, not just for themselves, but for the others uh, who are in the uh, encampment.